Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I am Chris Knudsen. I'm one of the uh, founders of Emergency EMS Medicine Live, and today is going to be our fourth uh, webinar. Um, if this will work, there we go. Um, so, just a quick overview for those who haven't seen this before. Um, our purpose here is to uh, create a social mo social group to discuss uh, EMS medical issues for uh, both community and academic EMS physicians and also for EMS providers. Um, hope to provide some uh, decent uh, information, maybe at some point some board prep. Uh, we have Dr. Martin Gill presenting in two months with a good topic for that. Um, also a chance for us to see each other, or at least you to see me right now, um, and bring together all of our skills to hopefully uh, get outside presenters from outside of New York State to, uh, to give them more information. Obviously, uh, there's myself, I'm one of the course directors, Derek Cooney, who I'm not sure is here yet, uh, we'll look for him, uh, and Brian Clemency out of uh, SUNY Buffalo, uh, who had this idea years ago, and uh, we're glad to have it working now. Um, during the presentation, we're gonna have everyone being muted, uh, just to keep things more sane. If you do want to, uh, ask questions, go ahead and chat me. I have my chat window open, um, so I'll try to answer them as they pop up. I guess you can raise your hand in the virtual world of Zoom. Um, uh, you can try that. I haven't seen that yet, but you can go ahead and try. Uh, we are recording this, and we will post this to our website, which I'll share at the end. Um, you can record from your site also, but it shouldn't be necessary. Uh, try to keep questions at the end. Uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask any questions or just message me and I'll answer them for you. Uh, if I don't see your chat question, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the group. Um, any problems, send me an email afterwards, uh, right here on the screen. Um, we've done very well with Zoom so far, so hopefully it'll, it'll continue on for us. Uh, today the speaker is me, um, to keep it simple. Um, that is yet, uh, one of the uh, Professors here at uh, SUNY Upstate. I uh, did my fellowship training at the University of Pittsburgh um, and uh, moved here about five years ago. And um, I'm involved in EMS education with uh, my agencies, the region, uh, with our paramedic program, uh, work with our fellowship, and uh, uh, do response uh, services as well. I'm just going to mute someone here. Okay, so uh, today we're discussing excited delirium and uh, sudden in custody death um, for a very good reason I'll discuss later. Um, there's different ways of describing what excited delirium is. Um, it's kind of easy to say what it's not. Uh, it's not universally recognized. Um, there is no medical diagnosis. Uh, doctors and providers can't diagnose patients with excited delirium. There's no ICD-9 code. The American Medical Association does not recognize the term. Uh, it's not a psychiatric diagnosis. There's uh, no DSM code that matches this as well. Um, it is more of a, what it is, is more of a descriptive syndrome. Several groups do accept the term and use the term in their literature and uh, in discussions with each other. Most of the physicians, medical examiners especially, EMS, police, and uh, the press as well, also do use the term uh, frequently. Um, it's one of those things where you kind of know it, you see it, and you know it. So uh, I'm going to provide an example uh, from Appleton Police Department in Ithaca, Wisconsin. Um, take a couple minutes. Maybe. Auto gave me 911. Hi, uh, I, something's wrong with my son. I'm 113 South Jefferson. I don't know whether he got caught. He's 29. I don't know whether he got on or something. He's just, um, very strange. I hope he doesn't need an ambulance. What are you reporting? I, I, I don't know. He's just talking and talking and saying it's going to die and he's just making. Like he's on something. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Yelling 
Here, hold on one second. Hi, it's okay. It's okay. As I'm not. It's okay. As I'm not. This is the last part. It's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm I understand. Is it gonna die? But I'm going to. Is it gonna die? But I'm going to. You're okay. Is I'm going to die? Ninety one to restrict traffic. But it's it's okay. What is his name? Tim. Tim, we need to go to the hospital. But I'm going to. 9102. Have Gold Cross come up to the address. Because I'm 1033 at this point. But I'm going to hear the heartbeat. Yeah. Oh, What's his first say, name again? Oh, I'm going to die. Tim. Tim. But I'm going to lay down on the ground. Can you lay down as for I'm me? I'm going to die. But Tim. I'm going to. Tim. Not, and you understand now. And isn't that fucking weird? But. 9102. It is nice he lays down by himself. Bias Gold Cross, I believe we have an excited delivery in case I need them here. We have the medics ready? Okay. All right. All right, let's move. Okay. All right, just relax. I get the medics up. Let's get them on. See the medics strap them onto the cup. I'm going to grab my balls. What? I'm going to grab my balls one last time. It's okay. I can feel I can hear this one. It's weird. Even though I'm okay, I'm going to grab my balls. Nobody's <laughs> Just relax. Lay your head back and relax, Tim. Tim, lay your head back and relax. Just, we're good. We're good. Tim, Tim you're all right. Tim, let's get him out of here. Broke his back with a shovel. Broke his back with a shovel. Grab a shovel. You may have a shovel in the backyard. Grab a shovel and pull his back out. Mom, grab a shovel, folks. You got it? Yep. I don't want to kill you. I don't want to kill him. Okay. okay. I don't want to kill him. But... That is one of my best, my favorite parts. At the very end, the gentleman says he's going to kill someone, and the medic commonly says, you don't want to kill me. And the patient says, I don't want to kill you. So um, very, as we discussed later, a very ideal situation with uh, 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 intervening for a excited delirium and uh, – uh, seeing the case. So there's three main components that kind of define excited delirium. Um, obviously delirium, so altered mental status, uh, fluctuating mental status, um, agitation, uh, where you're super strong, and excitation. Um, kind of break it down even further, obviously people are combative, bizarre, not right, uh, huge pain tolerance where you can hurt them and they can fight through it, um, and uh, sweaty, hyperthermic, and with that, they're oftentimes naked, um, which is not fun for anyone. Right, I'm gonna pause for one second. I gotta try to mute everyone, and hold on one second. Mute audio. If I miss you, try to uh, mute yourself, because there's some background, people are complaining of background noise. Um, tachycardic, tachycardic, very fast breathing, obviously paranoid, hallucinating, uh, like attacking things, um, and uh, don't listen to police. Uh, this is another hey, example. Uh, this is Steve. So obviously he's naked, not listening to verbal commands, not acting appropriately. This is not a real website. I've tried looking this up, and uh, actually there's no don't be like Steve dot com. You can hear the neighbors yelling him to calm down. So she's pulling out pepper spray. Come on, man. Oop, sorry. So to give him some space, starts destroying property. It's not complying, super strong, pushing through police. Slow mo. Um, they do often attack. Uh, well, I don't know if they often. There's been reports of people frequently attacking shiny objects, mirrors, glass. Um, uh, those kind of objects. Actually, some reports have been it's only about 10% of folks. They will damage uh, property. 
um, but not always mirrors and shiny objects. Of course, with this, you know, because they're in such a fight state, um, they're often hypothermic, uh, develop metabolic acidosis, rhabdo, and eventually multi-system organ failure if they get worse enough. Um, the past few years have not been the first time uh, we've seen excited delirium. Uh, apparently, it's been described back into the 1600s, uh, called Bell's Mania in the 1800s. Uh, obviously, back in the 1800s, they didn't have uh, medications to treat people with psychosis. Um, so they were institutionalized for their safety and the safety of the folks around them because uh, there's no way to treat them. And there are reports of these people developing similar symptoms, agitation, hallucination, paranoia, uh, a lot of fight uh, symptoms. Um, and in them, I'm not sure how they got the data, but they have about a 75% mortality. Um, we're not sure what happened, if they were strained, if they were fought with, um, but at least going back a ways, we know uh, high death rate. Uh, became more of a term in the uh, 1980s um, and uh, uh, used again in 1998 with uh, increasing use in literature and uh, publications. What causes it? Um, it seems to be pretty much agreed upon. Uh, stimulant use and psychiatric disorders are most common um, with some other medical or combination of these things. Obviously traditional, the good old days, we used to have just cocaine, PCP, and crystal meth. Um, cocaine's very uh, available. Um, Charlie Sheen's been known to use it a couple of times. Uh, PCP, I'll be honest, where I trained in Pittsburgh, I never saw PCP until I came to Syracuse. Um, arriving in Syracuse, there was a fish concert in my first, no, second or third month here, and uh, saw more PCP in one night that I've seen since then. Um, so I look forward to Fish's return to the Syracuse area. And of course, method, methamphetamines um, uh, being a, a common stimulant more so in the past decade or so. But now, uh, beyond just the, the traditional drugs of abuse, we uh, are seeing more and more of these designer stimulants or designer drugs, uh, the synthetic uh, that cathinones and the uh, synthetic marijuanas. Um, I'm sure all of you at some point heard about bath salts for the first time. Uh, I remember when I first did a couple years ago, was totally confused by any, why anyone would uh, smoke bath salts from Bed Bath & Beyond or similar type places. And uh, I'm sure there's a point in everyone's life when you realize that it's not from the mall, but from, uh, from other bad places. So these are bath salts, but not the kind we're talking about today. Um, Baths or uh, synthetic cathinones. There is a natural uh, uh, cathinone called cot uh, found in East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, um, very popular in Somalia and Yemen. Um, it is typically leaves are bunched up and put into the cheek to cause euphoria, alertness, and hallucinations. Uh, not very good for your teeth, but does not look much different than Mike Dykstra from the, the uh, Phillies years ago. Um, chemists got a hold of the cot um, in the early 1900s and began alternate trying to find a more medical use for it. Uh, they were trying to use it as an antidepressant, antidepressant stimulant, um, and those similar type uh, medications. There is actually one synthetic cathinone that's used for medical purposes, which is uh, Welbutrin, uh, obviously used uh, as antidepressant and smoking cessation therapy. Um, the cathinones you can see are very similar to MDMA and uh, amphetamines, and they're just defined by uh, an oxygen group, oxygen group on their group, oxygen group on their carbon train uh, off of their uh, carbon ring. Um, and these are some of the more common synthetic uh, cathinones, um, which are in distribution. But of course, there are dozens, or at least a dozen, if not more, uh, different kind of synthetic uh, uh, cathinones which um, each one changes their structure, changes their chemical properties, uh, changes their effect on people, uh, and also can have the effect of uh, skirting the law. So if you have a different chemical structure that's not specifically outlawed, in some places it may not be illegal until um, the state uh, changes the regulations. Um, most often it comes in little, white, in little packages. Uh, there are dozens of names. Uh, ivory wave is common, uh, meow meow, white Russian white lady, I've heard about personally, and they're usually little three gram uh, packets of some sort of plant material sprayed with the synthetic cathinone. Uh, so you roll up into a joint, smoke it, 
um, and get the effect. Uh, there are some uh, new kids in the block that are either coming or are here. Uh, at least in the Syracuse area, we've heard about Flocka and Gravel, which are new synthetic cathinones uh, with a very high uh, stimulant effect. Um, I don't know if we've seen it yet. Our toxicologists aren't sure either. I know it's been seen in Florida and Alabama uh, and other areas across the country. Uh, obviously, bath salts were big a couple of years ago, like it's three years ago now. Uh, we had a really rough summer uh, with them. Uh, lots of aggression, lots of danger. Um, in Austin, attacking paramedics and medics, um, trying to uh, eat police officers um, on a golf course. And uh, of course, attacking someone's face and trying to uh, eat their face off. Um, so not very nice stuff. Uh, moving on, synthetic uh, cannabinoids or marijuana. Um, obviously, marijuana is one of the top abused uh, medic not medications, drugs in the uh, country. Um, it is uh, highly available, but going along the lines of cot, people are trying to uh, make it better or different. Um, get a better high, maybe create some legal uh, ambiguity for themselves. Uh, so they've modified the chemical structure uh, to add on uh, different groups uh, trying to change its chemical properties. Uh, K2 and spice are by far the most common names, but like bath salts, there are dozens and dozens of ways to package it and way, things to call it. Um, this is uh, Ross Sullivan, one of our head toxicologists here at Upstate. Um, and um, the same thing as bath salts, they're packaged, they're sprayed with drugs, and they're distrib distributed, most probably coming from China, we think, um, but I've not seen proof of that. Uh, the reason I'm kind of doing this talk today is, uh, at least here in Syracuse, and I believe in New York City, uh, we've had a real spike in uh, synthetic uh, marijuana cases, which has gotten completely dangerous and uh, uh, you know, dangerous for the people who are smoking it, dangerous for our firefighters and medics, um, and dangerous for my, our ED personnel. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, we've seen about 15 to 20 patients per day. Uh, I think it was two Wednesdays ago, I worked an overnight shift and we had 15 patients uh, who had either been sent out to me or waiting for a, a, wake, a metabolized and wake up uh, or, or, or who came in uh, fighting with police, EMS, and my staff. Um, we don't exactly know what the difference is or what the change is. Uh, our toxicologists are trying to figure that out still. Uh, they think it must be either a, a new type of synthetic marijuana, a, an old type with a uh, uh, contamination in it, or one thought has been they mix synthetic cannabinoids with synthetic, synthetic uh, cathinones. So trying to mix in your high together, and it's not going well. Um, uh, people are abusing it like crazy in this area. My favorite patient recently was one who was admitted the night before I came on to my, came on for a 4 p.m. shift. A patient was there from the night before and left about uh, 4.30 after I got there. And he was back by 7 p.m., high as a kite, and uh, was probably going to spend the night again. So it's a, a large issue in this area. Uh, we've seen two types of this new spike um, in our area. Uh, we don't have names formed, just kind of defining them as type 1 and type 2. Uh, type 1 being uh, more comatose, more lethargic, bradycardic, hypotensive. They do get very agitated with stimulation. So if a nurse walks in the room, a med student goes to examine the patient, um, they sit up and moan and scream and, and try to hurt people. Uh, usually just 5 or 10 milligrams of Versed are highly effective. Um, and often they're intubated for airway protection um, and uh, sedation, over sedation with the, uh, the Versed. As compared to them, there's type two we've seen, uh, this, this new spike, tachycardic, hypertensive, super aggressive, um, large pupils, maybe some seizures. And these are guys we were given 45, 50 milligrams of uh, midazolam too, um, and often intubating just to, to put propofol or high dose Versed uh, or to paralyze the patient because they're so dangerous themselves in the staff. Uh, going back to what causes the site of delirium, uh, we, number two reason would be psychiatric disease. One is proven by history. Um, what causes it from the psych perspective? We're not sure if it's either untreated disease, exacerbation of untreated disease, 
are folks who suddenly stop their medicines. And why would stopping the medicines cause a problem? Either it's a withdrawal from whatever antipsychotic they're on. Uh, they have some sort of adaption to the medication they've been taking for years. They suddenly stop it and things get much worse. Or they simply stop their medication and whatever uh, schizophrenia and mania you, you would have seen just reemerges and, and is uh, uh, just more significant than when it was treated. Uh, we don't have a good reason uh, for any, or we don't have a good explanation for these besides saying um, psychiatric disease and stopping medications uh, can lead to excited delirium. One thing we always have to keep in mind, uh, especially for us um, when we're seeing high uh, volumes of patients with the same thing over and over again, we have to maintain a very high suspicion for a medical or trauma or another drug problem uh, causing these uh, changes in behavior. Um, obviously, medical problems from infections, hypoglycemia, uh, or other medications can cause these problems. Uh, head trauma, um, it is hard to know. And these folks who come in who are so combative and so um, out of control, they know exactly what happened to them. Uh, but a, a isolated head trauma um, uh, may also be a cause. Um, don't forget hypoxia. Uh, at least for me, one of my classic patients when I was training was uh, a 19-year-old uh, basketball player who came into the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, people at the basketball court uh, told the medics that the kid had been doing drugs. The kid came in. Um, he was combative, flailing around, not responsive to commands. Um, the medics had believed what um, the bystanders told them. Um, they restrained the patient as best they could. They could not get vitals because the patient was so um, combative. Uh, we got him into the room, finally uh, was combative with me and my staff, uh, and finally got, got um, um, vital signs in the patients and finally got a pulse ox in the 50s, uh, heart rate in the 40s or 50s. Mom came in, said he had bad asthma, uh, and on exam, he had almost no breath sounds. Ended up being a, a severe asthma attack, uh, leading to hypoxia um, in a 19-year-old kid who otherwise looked healthy. Uh, he made it. We got intubated, got to the ICU, and discharged four or five days later. Um, but hopefully, it's the last time I was fool I'll ever be fooled by you know asthma, asthma exacerbation parading as drug overdose. Um, but uh, you have to be concerned by that. Or right, keep an open mind. Look for other things causing this excited delirium. So how do we uh, um, manage these cases? I think the most important thing is protect your team. Uh, everyone from uh, firefighters and EMS through the, the techs, nurses, and other doctors and residents, um, these folks are violent. And you gotta, gotta watch out for your team, make sure they're safe um, with, uh, with these patients. And protect the patient as well. Um, it can be hard sometimes to uh, continue to care for your patients when you have 15, 20 patients we're all swinging at you, trying to bite your nurses, um, and, and being unkind people. Um, but we got to keep in mind they're they're people and they're patients and need our help, and that can be hard to find in yourself sometimes. Um, but as we're, I'm on my residents on a regular basis, it's important to to help our folks. Um, and the best way to, to help them is to diagnose and manage them properly. And this is kind of what it looks like when people come into my ER with uh, set of delirium. Um, there's often a officer and a nurse on each arm, each leg, someone laying across the belly, someone across the head trying to hold the, the face to one side so the patient isn't spitting at us or trying to bite someone. Um, and it can, I find it be kind of a scary a few moments uh, when patient, patients first roll in off an ambulance um, and they're barely contained and try to move them from a uh, stretcher, from a, a EMS gurney to one of our stretchers. It can be a pretty daunting process, and you have to be very careful and control your staff to make sure everyone's safe uh, before you do that. Um, I'm going to steal uh, uh, acronym rodeos. Obviously, how do we manage these folks? Restraint, um, oxygen, check their glucose, do a thorough, proper exam on these folks, watch them, and do serial exams, and uh, make sure you're not missing something. For restraint, like I kind of think there's three kinds. There's physical. Obviously, putting hands on the patient, keeping them from hurting themselves, hurting others is highly important. It should be temporary, though. Uh, it's not a long-term solution. We can't leave our patients fighting on stretchers against restraints. Um, it's not good for them, not good for our staff. 
don't want to use anything that gets progressively tighter. You don't want to cause ischemia of a limb or a hand or a foot. Um, do use your, your team together um, and coordinate, communicate uh, what who's doing what and uh, just be slow and careful. Uh, it is nice to say you can back away if you don't have the resources to confront someone. I don't think that's quite as true in the ER. There's too many people around not to confront these patients. Uh, in a pre-hospital setting, if you have space, kind of like what we saw with Steve earlier, um, you can give them some space to, uh, to do what they're going to do until you have enough manpower and enough um, help to, to control the patient properly. You don't want to be going one-on-one -on -one with these patients because we're probably going to lose. Obviously, the best thing as soon as you get physical control is chemical control. Um, and I don't care if it's IV, IO, IN, or a blow dart, which we're still working on fattening. Um, but, you know, you need to give them some medications to calm them down. Benzos are by far the most uh, easy to use and most frequently we use. Uh, we're using uh, Versed in our department, um, fast acting, get five or 10 milligrams IM. Um, and about half the time, it seems it, it works very well. They may need some higher doses sometimes. Antipsychotics have been proposed as potential uses for excited delirium. Uh, at least in our region, they're not available pre-hospital. Uh, I don't use them myself. Um, there could be a concern with uh, prolonging the QTC uh, if they have, a, have that in their EKG uh, and leading to a, a VTAC or VFib. Um, and uh, some of them may lower seizure thresholds, take a little longer to act. Um, so not, not first-line drugs. And even with our past two weeks of, of going through our spike epidemic, I haven't used any myself. Uh, ketamine, uh, increasingly used, is one of my new best friends. Uh, I have enjoyed using it on my patients because um, it works well, works rapidly, and can control our patients very well. I'll be honest, I'm still using midazolam most often. Uh, I know some of my partners have used ketamine with good success, and there's been antidotes from other um, facilities that uh, ketamine works well. Um, and kind of the ultimate sedation is kind of intubation, um, either if you have those type 1 patients or real comatose and they can't affect their own, own airway, um, or they're so combative that you use higher and higher and higher doses of sedatives without any effect, it may be time to um, intubate these patients for either paralysis um, or uh, uh, ongoing sedation will control the patient safely. Um, should we hyperventilate these folks? Um, be aware of it. If they have a metabolic acidosis, obviously you don't want to put your rate at eight or 10, uh, causing uncompensated metabolic acidosis. Um, so obviously you want to use your entitled CO2 monitor to, to see where they're at and uh, make sure you're not uh, causing worsening acidosis. Uh, once they are intubated, you can use high dose sedation. Um, I know recently, my last trip on Sunday, we had a very tough patient uh, who was on both propofol and midazolam. Um, wasn't being managed by myself. Uh, he has been signed out as being going to the ICU um, and uh, ended up the sedation, the MICU staff were, couldn't take the patient to MICU yet, so they're trying to manage the sedation over the phone with my nurses. And the patient came out of sedation uh, began thrashing around and actually lost his tube on uh, and the tube came dis dislodged which led to a, a kerfluffle trying to get the patient intubated again um, so just be aware their their needs for sedation may fluctuate um, and you have to be very careful not to let them get too light because it causes damage causes problems for the patient obviously in your examination a good physical exam watch out for head trauma watch out for signs of trauma these folks are putting their hands through walls, they're running into things, hurting other people. Uh, would not be uh, surprising if anyone has a serious injury. Uh, if you can't find it on your first exam, obviously as they're waking up, repeat exams are crucial. EKGs we're doing a lot of. Um, I have not seen any concerning EKGs myself in the past couple of weeks with our, our spike epidemic, um, but we should keep doing it and watch for those folks with long QTCs, watch for folks with EKG changes. Um, to make sure we're not missing something that will get more dangerous if they get sicker. Obviously, a CK level for rhabdo, uh, maybe a urine for myoglobin, troponins, uh, and uh, metabolic panels to see how their acidosis and ultralights are doing. The vast majority of the time, we just observe them, uh, keep them in the ER, and we call it metabolized to freedom. 
Uh, once the drugs wear off, they wake up, they walk around, they get their, their box lunch and some drink, out the door they go. Um, I don't have numbers, uh, but we are admitting, it feels like five or 10% of folks, mostly to the MICU if they require intubation. Obviously, serial reassessments, um, don't let them sit for hours and hours and hours without someone watching them. Go back in there and, and look at them and make sure they're okay. Uh, cooling uh, may also be necessary for these folks if they're hyperthermic. Uh, we're putting lots of uh, urinary manometers into folks uh, to keep follow their core temperatures. Sedation obviously stops the muscle twitching, stops their fight, um, and helps them cool off. Do what you need paralysis. Uh, my one patient the other day I did. Uh, but you have to worry about seizures, so it's not a really a good long-term um, option. Fluids, cold packs, cooling blankets, of course, uh, should also be used. Uh, for my pre-hospital providers, um, there are a few things we've been trying to keep aware of. Proper training is crucial. Um, you can recognize these folks from across the parking lot or across the, uh, the, the road pretty easily. Um, obviously, coordination of care between fire, EMS, and police is, is critical. Um, and knowing how to use restraints, how to secure folks to the backboard properly, um, how to uh, mobilize them. Obviously, hog tying patients is not a good idea. Um, it's been that way for, for decades. Um, but so on their backs, uh, with their arms to their sides, either using uh, devices to kind of give them a big bear hug so they can't move out of place, or handcuffs or soft rest or uh, leather restraints. Uh, and having uh, medical control available to uh, help the medics uh, control these people. Um, um, make sure your uh, base commanders are able to give better, to know their protocols for what the medics are facing and be able to give them orders to, to help keep the patient and uh, themselves safe. Uh, we recognized we had a, a big problem in our protocol about, well, let's see, I did an overnight shift on Wednesday. I think it was Monday or Tuesday when uh, two weeks ago when this spike thing just took off. It's really within 24 hours we saw a huge bump in these. Uh, and by Thursday morning, it was pretty obvious our, our senior protocol was not working. Uh, our protocol had been uh, for ultimate mental status, uh, paramedics were to call med control for an order for either Haldol uh, or midazolam. Uh, and we had a problem where when they were having seen police or fire, someone's restraining the patient and they had to wait um, especially if they got involved in patient care to get the patient secured so they could then call in to request the order. Um, and that was taking time. So you're increasing the time of physical restraint until chemical restraint. It could be talk, hard to talk to our crew sometimes with the, uh, the growling and the yelling in the background. Um, and we did have two paramedics hurt. I think one was bit and one had a, a I don't know if it's a strain or a contusion, um, because there's a delay in chemical, um, chemical restraint. Uh, I do give credit to the New York State Bureau of EMS. Within two days, um, uh, myself, uh, Dan Olson, the regional director, uh, Lee Burns, the state uh, EMS director, recognized the protocol was not, not adequate. Uh, and they extended us a, an emergency protocol change for midazolam, midazolam 10 IM or 5 IV as a standing order, um, which I have not heard any more stats in the past week. I apologize. Um, but um, that's at least the better idea, earlier chemical strength for these patients. And for medical directors, we have to do close chart review uh, to follow these cases and watch for complications and submit them to the state. So wherever you are in the country, make sure your protocols are adapted to, to address these patients. Uh, moving ahead a little bit. So that's excited delirium in a nutshell. Um, one other part of this is kind of sudden in custody death. Um, there is um, situations where you have these excited delirium patients um, who, uh, who die. Um, a couple in our area, uh, two or three years ago, there was a very unfortunate case of a uh, woman who took bath salts, uh, lived in an upstairs apartment with outstate staircase, uh, and was beaten up on her three-year-old son, actually threw him down the staircase. Um, and I think she followed him and was trying to hurt him further outside. Uh, neighbors came out, took the kid, and ran away until police got there. Uh, police tried to give her verbal commands. She would not comply, used tasers uh, to um, get compliance, and then she suddenly died afterwards. 
Uh, so sudden custody death, death after police arrival and, and begin restraint. Uh, we have another one here several years ago, I think it was 2010, a uh, gentleman by the name of Mr. Pinay um, died in uh, uh, the Onondaga County uh, Jail or the Justice Center. Um, there's video online I, I couldn't pull off, I apologize. Um, but he was using cocaine, police arrested him um, uh, because of uh, past uh, uh, warrants for his arrest and for his drug abuse, took him to the, uh, the jail, put him into a proper cell, and if you, you can pull up his uh, video online, he does have about six or seven gentlemen on him, kind of like we have in the ER, um, with a spit mask over his face, um, a knee, knee on his back, uh, patrolling his limbs, and the officers are trying to extricate themselves from the room. They've got him there. He's, uh, he was previously um, restrained. They put him in the room, take off restraints, and they back out of the room. And as soon as, well, I shouldn't say as soon as, within a couple minutes of them removing restraints and coming out of the room, uh, apparently he laid on the floor, became very still. And we're not, I'm not sure how long he was on the floor for before a nurse got to him, found he was in cardiac arrest, began CPR. Uh, Rural Metro, our, our local EMS agency, came to pick him up, uh, and he died. Uh, was pronounced dead at the ER um, later. Um, so he was another example of uh, in custody death. So I think we have to keep a law enforcement perspective on this. Obviously, I think uh, this is a, a tough position for our officers to be in. Um, obviously, EMS is not, in, well, at least here, EMS is not involved in restraining patients primarily. We leave that to uh, uh, police officers, um, and they come up on patients who are irrational and combative. They're doing silly things that are putting themselves at risk, um, whether it would be like Steve or the gentleman from Appleton um, who are trying to hurt themselves, a danger to officers, and a danger to the community. Uh, and the unfortunate fact is they must be subdued. Um, I guess the ultimate question is, if you had these patients, you put them out in the field somewhere in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, let them run around for a while, uh, what would happen? Would, they, would the medication wear off and they'd all be fine? Um, maybe, um, but it doesn't really happen in an urban, in a city environment. If they're wanting out, running out in traffic, they're gonna hurt someone or get themselves hurt. Uh, so it's up to the, the police to get these folks and, and restrain them. Um, there's a very clear progression uh, of sudden custody death. Uh, they have excited delirium symptoms. They're fighting, fighting, fighting. Police and others get involved, apply restraint um, to the patient, um, gain control. Then sometimes you see patients say they're short of breath. Um, listening to the news reports for the past few years, there's a case in California. A uh, patient was restrained, handcuffed, put in the back of a police vehicle. Uh, and you can hear the patient on the tape saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, and then they go suddenly quiet. And there's nothing. You don't fight. Uh, at some point, someone checks a pulse and finds out they're in either respiratory or cardiac arrest, uh, oftentimes from asystole or just a bad uh, bradycardic rhythm. Um, and then they die. Why do these folks die? Um, lots of ideas why. Um, different hypotheses, uh, catecholamine surge, um, and then drop, and so your fight or flight um, uh, reflexes get kind of screwed up, um, where you fight and then you, re you rest and then kind of collapse. Could it be due to hypokalemia from the metabolic acidosis? These folks do have pHs in the sixes sometimes. Uh, could it be due to uh, heart conditions? Not every patient with excited delirium who's restrained dies. Uh, so for those who do die, is there some sort of heart damage, pre-existing condition? Do they have a long QT syndrome we don't see because they die in the field before they get to the hospital? Um, is it some sort of psych problem or neurochemical problem? Not sure. I I'll be honest for myself, the, the idea of uncompensated acidosis is kind of attractive. Um, I mean, obviously, um, when these folks are fighting, um, using so much energy, um, they can put themselves into a lactic acidosis or a metabolic acidosis, which while they're running around, perhaps they can compensate for it. They breathe, breathe off CO2, so take their high hydrogen ions, uh, shift the buffering curve this way and blow off the CO2 so they have a compensatory respiratory alkalosis trying to balance out their low pHs. 
uh, and then come police or all others to help um, restrain the patient. Uh, and if, as we've seen on video here soon, and then as you've seen previously, um, oftentimes it involves physical force, pushing them to the ground, putting a knee on their back, a knee on their neck, um, or somehow pushing on their, their chest. Or if you're using a taser, the taser causes muscle contractions. If you apply the taser several times to the chest and they can't move their chest, they can't breathe, perhaps they, they can't compensate um, their, uh, their CO2 being blown off, the curve can't, can't buffer itself, and you have un, un, uh, uncompensated metabolic acidosis. So whether you have lack of, whether you have respiratory acidosis or an uncompensated metabolic acidosis, I'm not sure which, uh, but at least a cardiovascular collapse. It seems like an attractive theory to me. I don't think anyone has a clear um, hold on this yet. Um, this seems most attractive. We'll see what the research bears out in the future. Uh, how can we prevent these deaths? Uh, most often, minimize the struggle. Um, I think the good example from Appleton you saw was a police officer came in, saw the patient. Fortunately, in his situation, the patient wasn't combative, wasn't fighting with him, and laid down by himself. Uh, but then he waited, watched the patient, waited for backup, waited for EMS. So when they approached the patient, they approached him, applied physical restraint, and shortly thereafter applied chemical restraint. I don't think I included that in the video set, um, uh, but I did give the patient Versed in that situation. Um, so, um, so having someone there to apply restraint all at the same time, getting EMS there early from a police perspective, um, and having someone monitor the patient having one person's job not to be involved in the restraint and the medication administration, but just to monitor the patient, watch his breathing, watch his pulse, watch his vital signs, and watch for any sign of decompensation to try to intervene before they, they go into arrest. Oops. Um, so, so cardiac monitoring, watch respirations, uh, if they do have this really bad excited delirium, expect a decompensation. Uh, keep them on a cardiac monitor. Check their entitled CO2. Get them to the hospital prudently. And if they do arrest, early effective CPR. Um, I think uh, we've been pushing and hitting home on early effective CPR for cardiac arrests a lot for uh, the ED and our pre-hospital providers, maybe not so much for our police force. Um, I'll show you an example here in a second. So. I'm going to end with an example of a sudden in custody death. In October 2005, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Ronald, Donald Lewis uh, who was found by the side of a road. Um, so I'll start playing. I've kind of highlighted key points. This takes about 10 minutes, I believe. Um, and uh, we'll go through each one. Six, seven, out with the signal 20, 600 block of 45th Street. Oh, just to add, uh, this was. This unfortunate incident, um, an episode of Cops was being filmed with this police department. Um, so the images you have are from the cops crew uh, following this police officer. Um, and uh, it never aired on TV, but it they became released for, uh, for uh, training purposes. <laughs> Lay down. Lay down. What's going on, bro? Who? So naked. Not right in the head. Relax. Okay. I'll help you. Relax. So not listening to instructions. Stay there. Hey. Come here, boy. It goes from the side of the road. So he walks out into the road, danger to himself, danger to the population. The person who's in the car there in front of fortunately stopped, saw the police officer's car was stopped. So somewhere now, so at uh, 4.50 in the morning, uh, they begin applying restraint to the patient to uh, gain compliance. And you can tell this this officer is probably six foot four, um, and a very very large man, as we see later in the, the video. This gentleman he's restraining is obviously older, not in very good physical shape, um, and uh, 
is fighting very, very hard to the point where this officer, who's obviously in much better shape, is having a hard time controlling him for a while. So secondary help arrives. I think the other officer has his left knee behind the patient's neck. So that's that's important. So here we are at uh, four o'clock in the four forty eight in the morning. Um, so within three minutes, this kind of de -escal or escalated from just stopping the patient on the side of the road um, to him walking out in traffic to officers applying restraint. Um, and he noticed um, they called for EMS early. So within three minutes, they're already calling for par paramedics to come help him because they recognize this is not just a uh, police matter, but a, a medical patient that's sick. He's, he's overdosed on something. Oops. I'm Officer Shaw. I'm going to help you. you got to help me. Oops. What's the name? Hey, now. Yeah, we're just trying to uh, get here. Hold on one second. I got a slide. Here we go. I missed the slide. I apologize. So in the road still. One, two, three. So he's handcuffed behind his back. Three officers kind of drag him to the edge. Patient's trying to eat the officer's foot. To give the officer credit, they're trying not to apply pressure to his back. They're trying to have him sit up. They're trying not to, to push down his chest. I think this must be a supervisor who arrives with a taser. Sit up on your butt, man. So trying to get him up off the ground to a better position. So they're trying to get him up off the ground. Obviously, being on his stomach is not a very safe position. Uh, I don't know if it's part of their protocol or if it's a common police procedure. I'm not sure. But at least they're trying to get him up uh, away from a, a dangerous position. That being said, it changes. I'm going to help you. you got to help me. What's your name? Hey, now. Yeah, we're just trying to... So you see how hard the officers are working. They're short of breath and they're all sweaty. You can imagine this guy and how hard he's working, too. So they changed their restraint right now. So they begin to hog tie him. Shoulders to the back, or I'm sorry, knee to the back, hog tied. And they actually lift his feet and his pelvis off the ground, kind of forcing his chest into the ground. You notice right now he's still breathing. So, a much different situation from the last slide where they're trying to sit him up not restrain him to this slide, where now they're applying more and more restraints. So you can see here, we started over again. So this is not that long after the last slide where he was heaving, now look at him now. He's not fighting. He's not taking breaths. I would say the arrest probably begins right there. 20 seconds later, So they recognize something bad is happening. Keep in mind, police officers are not medics. 
to trying to get the bag to get an Ambu bag at least they have. It's been seven minutes. Medics are still in route. Not arousable. Still hog tied. Back going again. Got a pulse. Okay. All right. He's probably going to stay unconscious unless we have to undo the hobble. If we have to hobble again, we'll hobble again. Right. All right. I need a light. Okay. So he has a pulse. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out what they're doing. They finally do get him sitting up because he can't. He's not fighting anymore. No oxygen. Look at his airway right there. So they're trying to do rescue breaths with his chin on his chest. At least they know enough to try to get his airway open. I'm not sure why they have him sitting up. I guess it's probably because he's hogtied and has his hands behind his back still. So this is about eight minutes after the call started. People are not still they feel impulses. Not sure if they have one. They decide to go for a CPR. The patient's obviously flaccid. And it takes about. 45 seconds by the time they decide he's in cardiac arrest to begin CPR. So 5430. So this is 2005, and to be honest, I can't remember my uh, AHH pro AHA protocols uh, with the uh, uh, respirations to compressions were, I'm guessing five to two. So, only got about 30 seconds of CPR before they stopped, but they do have a spontaneous return of circulation. Breathing. Take, stop this for a second. Check, check, check his airway. Listen, put your head down there and listen. There you go. Get down. So, kind of the old look, listen, and feel. See if they're breathing. Keep the back, keep back, keep back. Rescue breathing. Take your time. A little slower. So, she does say, I'm not sure who she is, but she kind of takes charge of the medical part. Um, I think she's an officer, says so breathe slower. Again, metabolic acidosis, maybe some hyperventilation. But does he have a head injury? Uh, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I think I have my time stamp wrong. They do have a pulse again. Right about now. He's got a pulse. Keep the breathing going. Are you getting a chest rise on? Yeah, it's right. Okay. So, skipping ahead, so we're at uh, 4.55, a couple minutes later, EMS arrives. They're trying to figure out if they should do CPR or not. I got it on the stack. It's there. So it's 457 EMS arrives. It's going to skip forward here in a second. No, I'm not. We didn't have one, and we had one. So it's just skipping ahead. Right about here. So about four minutes after I started, begin CPR. 
They do mention he has a pulse in the 40s. So I'm, I'm unclear if it's in PEA. So see how big that guy is compared to everyone else at the scene? He's huge. You can see the quality of CPR. So he's going, what, 50 times a minute with one hand here, trying to do his monitor and CPR at the same time. Here's a gentleman right behind him with an intubation tube. Then we don't kind of lose the, the team here. So, I think they're trying the intubation here. They pause CPR in about 20 seconds. And we'll skip ahead. It's kind of towards the end of the video. I pulled up and he's standing in the middle of the street, jumping up and down, laying in his arms, and he's sweating. Yeah. The first, I, the first thing I ask him is, like, good, what kind of dope you doing? Are you all right? And then he goes running across the road and his car's coming. So I get the car. So we'll swing down to the, the scene That's again the here. So we're a couple minutes out from starting intubation. He's trying to sternal rub. Gentleman's chills on his knees trying to intubate. No CPR. So this is the officer who responded first, walks away. So I put in there, I wonder what his mental, mental health or mental state is like at that point in time. Walking back to his vehicle, I'm not sure what happens afterwards. Um, but obviously, within 15 minutes, it goes from a perhaps a routine stop to being the death of a of a of a person, um, which he restrained and then ultimately died. It did lead to a lawsuit between the gentleman's family and the city. Um, I forget off the top of my head what the result was, but I think there was um, some findings, um, and uh, it kind of shows you how fluid these situations are. Um, how quick they can change from being able to stop to being someone decompensating. Uh, you can see how the restraint um, was applied. Obviously, the hog tie we mentioned before should never be used, should not be kept in their chest. Um, some uh, positional asphyxia probably does not help with the metabolic acidosis and the uh, upset of delirium. Um, unlike the Appleton case where they had early EMS involvement with this, the restraint, they didn't have EMS on scene for approximately nine, 10 minutes, uh, and unfortunately had a very different uh, patient outcome. Um, so that's my, that's the talk about excited delirium and uh, uh, sudden in custody death. Um, talked about excited delirium, causes, treatments, keeping your team safe, and then talked about in custody death, uh, keeping your team safe, watch the patient, be very cautious how police are restraining the patient, watch the patient, and uh, uh, you know, get involved early if at all possible, and you can do so safely. So that's my end of my presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, text me or I'll unmute people. Give you a few seconds. Nothing. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. I was trying to log in to watch and I was unable to do so for whatever technical reasons. Will this um, lecture be available to view? Yes, actually. Um, I'm just going to pull it up here for people. It, we actually started a website. Uh, if you search for Upstate EMS Fellowship, uh, mm -hmm. we are one of the tabs underneath application and what we do. Uh, EMS Medicine Live is right there with a copy of um, the slides and a copy of the presentation uh, and also in Facebook uh, EMS medicine live uh, as a site and when we we link our YouTube channel up to Facebook so you can watch any of the videos there as well okay great great anything else no good all right well thank you for attending uh, I hope this was useful if you have any feedback I always want to hear about it uh, if you go to contact us, if you have any topics you want to discuss, uh, if you want to uh, get involved in presenting some, a case or a good topic, let us know.
Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next month. Uh, we're still working on the topic. Uh, in two months, we have Chris Martin Gill from the University of Pittsburgh giving uh, flight physiology uh, as it relates to air medicine. Uh, we do have Jeremy Cushman from Rochester uh, doing a piece of the patient in a couple more months. Um, but uh, I'd like to get more folks involved if you're willing. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.